Welcome to On the Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. I'm Brian Cantrell. With me, as always, is Jess Frizzell. Hey, Jess. Hey, Brian. Joining us in the garage is our boss, Steve Tuck. Hey, Steve. Glad to be here. And Jess, do you want to introduce who we've got today? So today we have Star Simpson, who is currently working on drones, but also has made uh, boards in the past, given a lot of awesome talks on making custom boards, and is just all over when it comes to the hardware software interface. Star, welcome to the podcast. It is great to have you here. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So Star, I've got a bit of a confession. I, I feel this happened many times when you would have some incredibly interesting tweet. And I would tell Jess, like, when are we getting Star on the podcast? <laughs> so we, I know that we, we've been looking for you to join us for a long time. We're very, very happy that, that you could accommodate it and with your schedule. So welcome. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I was so flattered when you invited me. Uh, so you described yourself as having a checkered past. You've been all <laughs> over the map. So where should we take it from? You want to start from the beginning? How did you get into this stuff? Oh, goodness. I mean, well, I would say that I got started in hardware. You know, I don't know if this is a classic story or like a precocious story. Like, I don't know. I was like 14, I think. Actually, maybe let me back up. I remember the first time someone told me about programming. Let's start there. Yeah. I was, I, I think, seven, eight or nine, something like that at my first school. And we would carpool. Uh, it was me and like two other kids. And one of the carpool parents was the school secretary. So she would come with us to school because she worked there also. And she knew that I was super stoked on computers, but my school was trying to be at the cutting edge. So they only bought Apple computers, which was like a huge expenditure, but like they were really trying to do the best for us kids. Unfortunately, in the 90s, Apple computers were like behind glass, you know, you could bang on the glass, you couldn't really get into them. So I would tinker with it, you know, see what I could do. Um, but, you know, I remember on the drive to school one morning, this woman, she said to me, she's like, you know, I could tell you really like computers. Like, I bet you'd like programming. And I was like, what's programming? And she's like, well, you know, those programs you use. I'm like, yeah, I know the programs. I know like super munchers. It's the best. You know? <laughs> she's like, programming is where you make the programs. And it was just like galaxy brain. Like, oh my oh, God, wow. someone <laughs> makes the software. <laughs> And um, after that, I remember, so this is actually how I got into hardware. Um, I remember trying everything to understand how to do the programming because I wanted to make the programs. And I, I eventually ended up, I think, you know, forgive me, like pirating Borland Metroworks C++ Code Warrior nice. <laughs> for the Mac. Now, was that your next step from the carpool? I mean, that's a big step. The, your action actually, yes. Wow, that that is that's a precocious there child. There was no one around me <laughs> to I guide me. I didn't accept. know where to begin. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's what oh the God. internet told me to do. Because right. the internet at the time was like, uh, yeah, um, if you just if you can't write like a shell interpreter, then like, are you even a programmer? And I was like, I don't know, I'm nine. <laughs> 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 so it seemed like that you know that's everything pointed me in that direction. I needed to get the thing to do the thing. I got the thing, and unfortunately, you know, due to my ineptitude at pirating or whatever, like it just didn't come with the standard I/O library. Okay. And so like it came with a hello world code example that, that was, wouldn't compile. Oh, right. Because you didn't have streams, right? IO streams. It was missing no, IO streams. Right? Yeah, okay. exactly. And so, you know, I was just like, oh, wow, this is like way harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And so that's kind of how I like kind of ended up bouncing off of coding initially. And um, instead just like keeping this like burning fire under the surface of like, I want to learn more about the computers. I don't know what to do. Um, the C++ thing is like inscrutable and kind of a nightmare. And so then like a few years later, right, you can imagine I still keeping my eye out. Like, I don't know how to do this. I really want to do it. I found a book on like kind of like building your own circuits and I was like, there it is. And I took that book and I went to Radio Shack. Like somehow this is oh, more, Radio more Shack. accessible, right? Rip Radio Shack, right? Rip Radio Shack. Um, we paid an enormous sum of money to me at the time, being a preteen with no cash on my own. I was like, I can't believe my mom's spending this much money um, to buy a bunch of circuit components from Radio Shack. And I spent like the entire summer just building every circuit example in the book. Oh my gosh. And, so, wow, and so it was like my failure to get the code example to compile sent me directly into circuit design. Yeah, I, I don't know what to think about C++ coming out of this, because my I'm mean, going in thought is that you were abused as a child by C++, <laughs> but now that C++ actually drove you to hardware, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Look. <laughs> That's great. So then getting excited about hardware, obviously, over that summer, making like, I assume, you, were you making like 
burglar alarms and the what, what I'm yeah, trying to that kind of thing. Yeah, right. You know, you know, the, and the funny thing is, it gave me the strong impression that like initially that like code was completely inscrutable, but like hardware, you could always get to the bottom Accessible. of the problem. <laughs> right, hardware is easy. Actually, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's I can. Well, and it would allow you to probably completely understand what was in front of you because clearly you you were at, even at a young age someone who really wanted to understand things. I really wanted to understand things. Yeah, at their root. Yeah. Uh, the book, I think it was like 21 transistor pro you know, sl slowly worked you up to, I remember the final thing was like mind blowingly cool to me, which is like a circuit that had memory. Like you could unplug it and like plug back in and like the led, oh, the four led state would be the same. Nice. You actually had persistence. It had persistence and it had like, I, I think I put two copper wires on the board. So like it had like a touch input to like increment the led count. And so that is great. So at that point, did you, I mean, you obviously felt a very deep resonance and and did you have an idea of what you wanted to go do at that point? I had a vague but strongly directional idea. Yeah. I didn't know exactly what, because again, I was like still roughly as informed as like the kid who was like, okay, um, the programming, I got to, I don't know where to begin, right? Like I'm just reading everything I can. Yeah. I got into, you know, I was really lucky to be able to get into things like uh, robotics or like building potato cannons with my best friend in, in the summer, you know, like various stuff, you know, of varying levels of uh, sophistication or lack thereof. And it all really drove me to like, I knew I wanted to make stuff for people that was going to be useful. Right? I think that was like the shape of my uh, hope. Right. That's that engineer's calling, right? To actually build something that people would actually use. So, uh, so what next? Did you head off to school? Uh, I did. Um, I went to MIT. I found out there were many le levels of nerd. <laughs> 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 so uh, that was pretty, uh, pretty cool also. Right. Because you kind of go in thinking like, I am the nerdiest person I know. And then you get to like the true like, nerd I don't know if I thought dome. that. I yeah. really, I was actually quite intimidated before things even began. I really, I was just like... I know there are people out there that like know about these things and I want to know those people and yeah. I want to go like explore. And how did you get over that intimidation? Because I think that that's something that, that everybody kind of feels where it's like, wow, everyone is so much better. I've certainly felt that. I think most technologists have felt that at one point in time in their career or another. I think that there's a way of looking at things where you can either take a comparative and competitive view of the world or you can take a collaborative view of the world and maybe you could take both, but I don't know about that one, right? It's like, I think that at some point you just say like, okay, everyone who's like wildly curious ends up knowing a whole lot about something, right? And, you know, this should be celebrated is my approach. Yeah, I just want to, right, understand this. Now, in Jess, is, Jess, you can obviously, Jess engages what I would call competitive curiosity. You're very good at like. So, yeah, well, it depends because like. <laughs> no, it's cool, Jess. It's cool. <laughs> it really depends. <laughs> the competitiveness, I think, comes into play if like I feel attacked. And, and other situations. Yeah, okay. Jess is a very competitive, very collaborative person. I mean, don't get me <laughs> wrong. I really love competitive atmospheres. I was like a really fierce high school athlete also. I was oh, a swimmer. Oh, wow. um, like there's a, there's totally a place for competitive spirit too. But I think that in so far as it makes you feel intimidated, I think that like it's, it's okay to accept that like being really into something doesn't necessarily mean anyone else also being really into that thing is like herming you or taking away yeah, from you. Totally. Right. I think that that's it. Right. That's the like, and I think that certainly just, that's what you're great at. It's like, Hey, I've discovered something great. I'm going to share it with everybody because yeah. I think it's interesting. But I also think part of this podcast is finding those people who do the things, which is cool. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, because I, I love anyone who is just like really curious about a topic and goes super in depth. I'm like, OK, I want to like know what's going on in their brain. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of topics in depth, so you have done a bunch with drones and I am really curious about how that started and when, because you were probably uh, you were really kind of on the forefront. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, I don't know what exactly hit me, but I would I'd probably mark 2009 as me having developed an obsession with uh, autonomous aircraft. Right. And started to think about it a lot then. So, you know, I usually give people a few minutes head start to run before we bring this topic up because oh nice <laughs> oh I, i'm excited <laughs> that's great i don't want that Lean in. Yeah, exactly uh wow okay so 2009 i'm trying to think Roughly of in terms yeah. of the history of autonomous aircraft 
that's early from a kind of a an accessibility perspective, right? I mean, in terms of like yes and no for for how we currently think about what we say drones, uh, yes. But from the history of autonomous aircraft, no. I mean, most people don't realize Marilyn Monroe actually worked in a drone factory during the war. Oh, interesting. Uh, because this was just sort of like radio controlled target drones that the military were using at the time for like target practice, or whatever. She actually had a wartime mm. job, which is like assembling these things. That's interesting. Nuts. Wow, that's not yeah. Because I, I feel and Steve, I don't know about you or just I, I feel like my first association with that is what is the military using them post 9-11 yeah. in Afghanistan. Oh, not- absolutely. And that was a huge part of my inspiration because at the time, all of the headlines that included that word drone were pretty terrifying, right. yeah. fairly negative. And I, I don't know why, but my approach at the time being, you know, college students sort of being curious, where do ideas come from? How does technology work? Was to say, you know, that can't be the end of the story for this technology. And like, what would I do if I had a drone? I would do something different with it. What yeah. would I do? Or if so I had autonomous aircraft, what would I do? That is so fundamentally optimistic, I think, which I think this is a hallmark of technology. I think is, is optimism. And I think as a society, we can be very pessimistic about technology. Fair. Uh, and I think it's good on you to realize that, like, actually, we can do something different. We don't need to. This, this has got applications that are not merely in the military. Or it might, and if it were to, what would those be? Right. Uh, that started me thinking. So then where to from there? Well, I mean, as mentioned, I was a college student, and college students are always hungry, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so like, the answer to my question was I'd use it to bring food to myself. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That, that's kind of like a thing, I feel like. Oh, yeah. T- you way are, before your time. Yeah, you are way <laughs> before your time. And I feel like you're after like all three of us are definitely eating plays a central role in all three of our lives. <laughs> totally, totally. totally. I, I can't think of a person for whom that's not true. <laughs> right. Okay, so you're like, I am going to use this. To Autonomous food. food delivery. Well, that's a huge part of it. For me, I think the, the goal was to try and bring people into kind of what I saw might be possible. Mm. You know, I'd also say that like, if you could have food brought to you right now, right, this was like very relatable example that everyone could get on board with. You know, I basically just started keeping notebooks of ideas of like, here's what I would do if I had this autonomous aircraft. The one that I think I became known for, which is called the taco copter on the theory that you could have a a quadrant or bring you a taco to your location on demand. That's the one that really had traction. Right. But even at the time, I, I would like to state for the record, I was thinking about what would be valuable. <laughs> Price per pound of tacos is fairly low. Right. <laughs> right. But like it caught people's attention. Like, look, you are more than just the taco copter. I think I, I, it's the taco copter is the but that's big, genius. It, it is genius. I'm not wearing a hoodie right now, but now I wish I was so that I could pull the hood over my face. Right. <laughs> And where are quadcopters when you are starting to think about this? At the very bleeding edge. So at the time, actually, I'm in undergrad. A few of my friends were aerodynamic students or like more into the like the embedded systems, you know. And I remember one of them at like great expense had um, had written a letter to Atmel to get them to like give us three accelerometers that were like, you know, $100 each uh, and hand built a quad rotor. Um, But it was like really lashed together. Like now you can buy kits. It's like there's fairly good support for like if you want to do this yourself, you know, starting from scratch, writing the embedded system to control the thing, you know, all of that. Could you educate us on that exactly? Because I know there's a lot of software involved in, but I don't know what what any of that software looks like. So what are the kind of the key hardware components and the software to kind of stitch it together? Sure. So uh, that drone and and a lot of drones, uh, a lot of quadcopters are four electric, uh, electrically controlled motors, an accelerometer, which basically measures the direction of gravity or G-forces as you move. And if you imagine like a basic hover um, where it's just staying in place, it seeks to balance the current output through the motors so that the position doesn't drift. Did that make any sense? Yeah, that definitely yeah, made sense. Awesome. Well, so it, yeah. and it kind of the follow-up question is, because this is something I has been kind of been my intuition, but I'd love to get the definitive answer. It seems to me that it is not really possible to build a quadcopter without software. Is that a, is that a fair statement? I would actually flip that statement. And I would say that the quadcopter is really interesting because if you know how to write software, it's one of the first flying things you can kind of trivially control without having to get into aerodynamics or control or any of these like esoteric fields that have been developed for the last 50 years because it's symmetric aircraft, right? So you can really kind of naively say like, okay, if it's like tipped that way, bring the power up on (laughs) this motor, bring the power down on the opposite one, right? Oh, interesting. And like get it to hover or like, you know, accept some constant velocity to get it to go in a particular direction, right? Uh, So it's a a really neat platform for allowing software to fly. 
Interesting. That's cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, because like if it was a plane, you'd have to know how the wing dynamics. What's and an aileron? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. Right. You have to do a, a lot more, a lot more physics. It sounds like, whereas it, it's some, not, yeah. But without a, it seems to me that, but kind of before the era of software avionics, some of the stuff was would have been much more difficult or impossible. Or is that a? Yeah. Um. I mean, the quadcopter configuration, I think, would be pretty difficult cult for human pilot. Well, I mean, there've been very few experiments, but uh, <laughs> there was one note, the Piasecki PA 79 or 97, I can't remember, uh, which was four, I think, Huey helicopters in a like airframe with a, like a blimp. Uh, and like it rattled itself. Over. Like, and you know, you have four pilots trying to like human beings on board, trying to like coordinate with each other to like keep it balanced. It's like, uh, that's not. it seems much better when it's just software. Yeah, see, this is where I'm like fundamentally a coward. I, I like you first in that thing. I'm not I getting would that do thing. it. That sounds cool. This, well, see, this is the same. Uh, uh, spoiler uh, alert: that was not a good aircraft to get. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. That That's didn't right. end well. Jess has wanted to rent a scissor lift for the oh. office to drive around the Tried office. Had to talk her down. Yeah, multiple Steve times. I, yeah, a little. Yeah, why are we bringing this up? You already said that I couldn't. <laughs> Just saying no, you're courageous. I, I, I just I just know that this this urge is bubbling underneath the surface. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll try anything once, basically. <laughs> yeah, Except so, a scissor lift. Yeah, I, yeah right. well, because I'm not allowed. <laughs> right. But this is basically beyond the control of humans to reasonably fly, I would assume. Humans can't react. I assume? Or maybe not. I'm not going to say it's impossible. Right. Uh, but I think there are certain controls tasks people are better suited for and certain controls tasks that uh, software would be better so or software in the loop, if nothing else. So were you in that era? So you, you're building the taco copter. So how did that go? You say so you're, you're talking to your folks. Uh, that, it's kind of a funny story. I mean, the taco copter is one that sometimes I still get a little bit of uh, like, I don't know, I get a feedback for it because it, there's a lot involved. Let me let me put it this way. So as I do. I got really interested in this world to the point of complete obsession. And this is like, I'm fresh off the back of my teenage Star Wars obsession. So I didn't know how to not talk about something that I was obsessed with. And it got to the point that like, I got invited to like a party, I think in, I was in San Francisco for some reason. And um, I just wouldn't stop talking about like drones and how they were going to be super important part of the future at this party until like the host was like, yeah, so everyone's, good Everyone? no one right. wants to hear any more about drones uh, <laughs> but why not i would be yeah. like okay listen this is a messed up party yeah because, i agree like, any I, other yeah. party i'd be like okay that i want to talk to that yeah, person. people are reporting to the host to like take <laughs> yeah, the people drone are, like, talk escalating down. to the host so this I is mean, actually an on. important part of the story so then the the host of the party gave me the, he kind of had taken me aside he was like so like you know just a thought like why don't you like make a website you know for your for your concept and I was like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> so I made the I made a website for the taco copter and that was all that happened. Basically, it was like a text only website. I really thought that the uh, idea to make a website was brilliant for a specific reason, which is like a college student, I didn't have a ton of cash, but I had to pay for the domain and I knew the domain was going to expire every year. And I was really worried that I was going to like forget about the idea of using autonomous aircraft to like do stuff. And I didn't want to lose it. And so I figured if every year the domain renewal would like be a nudge of like, is this an idea that's time whose time has arrived yet? Um, which is why I made the website. OK. And it's really crucial to establish that this was not supposed like some thing to like try and get the world's attention or anything, which is what ended up happening. So the website pretty much just sat there. Nothing happened. There was nothing on it. And then like a year ish later, I want to say like 2010, maybe 2011, something like that. I was like. Uh, I should spruce up that old like taco copter website, just kind of like beautify it. And here's the fun backstory. So probably like 10, 20 of my friends, something like that, like a very close group of people had seen or heard of this website. And one of my friends who's just like, he's constantly trying to like, I don't know. He's, he's, he's kind of a, like a schemer. I don't know. Like he's always like, he's like, oh, here's how I'm getting more like points for my like, hacker news account or whatever. Right. So he <laughs> turned out and I, I learned all of this in retrospect. He had made a new Hacker News account and he wanted it to get a lot of like karma points or, you know, whatever. And a catering company, like a YC funded catering company launched and they were like, hey, like super like serious launch announcement. Like, oh, we're like delivering lunch now for companies. And my, this guy he goes on there and this like smart comment he's just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But whatever. It's like too bad. The taco copter isn't delivering yet. And he posted the link to like my like 
you know, page out of my notebook, like knowing this is not for anybody like website. Right. This is to remind you every year to contemplate whether this idea has yeah, come I or realize not. this is very unusual to use the internet in this way. Right. Right. No, no, it's you know awesome. what? I, it feels, it feels very close to home. But I, I don't know. know. I, I like, like it. I like it. <laughs> Nonetheless, I, so I had done it. Right. And, uh, and so he posted this and then someone else, uh, saw the link and it was like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And this website, I promise you, it looked like a complete joke. There was like animations going everywhere. It was like cartoony and, you know, all the colors. Next thing you know, uh, you've got four term sheets. Yeah, so contrarian. <laughs> well, yeah, there was even a little banner in the bottom because I also had bought Lobster Copter. Uh, that was like, because I was in Boston at the time. And so right. I was like, oh, that's good. I was like, Lobster Copter is like tacos of the East. <laughs> Lobster <laughs> right? so, Copter. Like, I- that's a, that's an interesting that's really uh, collision good. of worlds. I like it. So then someone took the link and posted it to like the main hacker news. And this was on like, I want to say like a, like a weekday night. Right. So like this clearly hilarious website was like people were starting to email it to each other. Cause in 2011, you know, it was still like, so not it, like on the website, you said it's a, kind of a page of your notebook. So this is just like an, a, a sketch of what this thing would look like. A like. bookmark for an idea. Got it, okay. You know, that's how I was treating it. Right. So people start to email each other this link and it turned out like my, my best friends from high school had uh, professionally gone into like super high volume, high traffic website hosting. Like, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening. I didn't know where the traffic was coming from at the time. I actually just knew it had picked up an interest because I was in a weird time zone and the sign up form was tied directly to my email. And it was also my birthday and I got 10,000 emails. <laughs> like some, someone wow. is, someone's messing with me, you know, like something's happening. <laughs> oh, so you, I don't you know had what. a sign up on there to oh, say, yeah. oh, did the whole, like if you're interested, if you're interested, yeah. right. Um, and 10,000 people were interested. 10,000 people. And so I said to him, I was like, I, Oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening, but like this is getting a lot of traffic. And he said, and this was like a huge critical part of it. He's like, you know, I think this idea is really important. I really like this idea. Do you mind if I stand something up with like varnish or whatever? Like this is more likely to stand up to all the traffic you seem to be about to get. And I was like, yeah, sure. Go for it. Whatever. And he basically put a like super simple, like bootstrappy website up, which like for better or for worse, had all of the look of like basically a startup. Legit, you right know. now it looks legit. Yeah. So instead of my like total cartoon sketch, <laughs> right, like right, okay. nightmare, uh, it, it looked like a standard bootstrap website. Right, right. Um, and the other thing that happened is cause I was in the weird time zone and he was just like, you know, flying through this at like, you know, the nighttime the next morning when everyone checked their emails because their friend had like sent them this like joke link, they saw this like super serious thing. And you know, maybe like PR marketing professional could have predicted that like how this is going to go, but I had no idea. So um, then the taco copter uh, was like a big news story and I ended up on the Colbert report. Oh my gosh. Whoa. That's I, nuts. That is amazing. I really didn't expect it. I was like, I was traveling myself. It was all completely unexpected. Several YC funded companies for food delivery <laughs> folded because they knew they couldn't compete. Started actually. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah. right. Exactly. That's crazy. So wait, it's all hacker news is like a patient zero. Patient zero. Yeah. My, my friend and his like throwaway account. <laughs> wow. So how, I mean, how did you, I mean, you must have been like, look, this was like a bit of a, not quite a joke, but this is a, this was some early ideation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is why I like point out that like, I, I think I'd also registered a bunch of others. Like I'd registered docucopter on the theory that you'd want to quickly like schlep around legal documents or things with actual value. Cause people, docucopter. people docucopter. for years. Oh, since, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also had hemocopter on the like medical. Ooh, hemocopter. Ooh, that's good. God, I, you just went on a bender for the, I was buying up domains. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Doc copter should be a TLD. Doc copter should, that's <laughs> I don't true. know if we're ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how that all went. Right. And I like, I, I think there's a part of me that still feels like I need to defend, like it wasn't, really intended as a joke. It's something I really strongly right, yeah, believe it was, it, in right. that was, it was early. It, was it wasn't er- quite intended for the world. Right, 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 right. It was early ideation. But, but that's that really cool. Well, but I also feel, and I'm sure you got this, that people can be, and I, it's very annoying when people are so critical of early ideation, where it's like, well, why haven't you built this thing yet? It's like, because it's an early idea. Well, we had, we'd messed around with like, um, a friend of mine has like, he, you know, was super into building drones. So we hung grocery bags full of tacos and like flew them around. And so so this is further along. This is more than just a page in the notebook. Then you'd actually built the thing. You know, like we had experimented with it and like explored it. But I think that 
there were a lot of things technologically in terms of like public acceptance of the idea, uh, regulation, like more so than now there were, there were no rules governing whether you could do this or not. It just seemed like, and I was pretty, I was actually weirdly like very conservative about that whole out, you know, thing because I'm like, I think there's a quote I gave at the time and I'm proud of it. I think it was like 22 or 23. I was like, it's um, not unreasonable to regulate this because there are some risks. Oh, well, um, now you just capsize another YC company. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness you know like we we looked into it it's, yeah, it's not that we hadn't but then at the same time people were like well how much is really there and you know we you know i was i didn't have like a incorporated anything you know i was like working on some other thing so it ended up kind of exploding and then collapsing because yeah, people sure. are like you know i think i think it was actually wired ran like a hit piece at the end of like a week of like what is happening like media Jeez. coverage and then wired was like it's a hoax um, and i was like how dare they <laughs> Why would you like what? Who are all you people and why are you in my yard? Right, right, right. This wasn't even supposed to be here. Uh, I wasn't supposed to come to work today. That is so, any of you. Is that where it ended up? Is it with the, the wired hit piece? Was that the coda for the taco copter? Or? Mm, roughly speaking, yeah, because I still wasn't like I was still working on some other project. Um, but I think that is like, as you mentioned, about when a bunch of kind of current drone companies launched. Um, it was a few months after that, a bunch of bigger tech corporations announced their quadcopter based initiatives. Well, they need a taco copter response, clearly. I mean, yeah. it, I guess that they have the host of a party to thank. It's also <laughs> predictable now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So what were you building at the time? What did that inspire? Oh, gosh. Building? Uh, I was working on something completely unrelated that in retrospect was like never going to be a really easy business to start. But I had done some work in college on a project in my own free time to make uh, like electronic components on the idea that I could like make electricity like more legible or like easier to understand. So hmm. anyway, I That's cool. it was one of a couple of things I ended up going off to try and start and uh, was working on at the time. That's great. And so, uh, and then so what was after that? What, what came next? Roughly nothing relevant for a little while. I was, you know, just doing electrical engineering stuff or getting more into sort of like my, in my job, like understanding manufacturing better um, for like a couple of years. I think I was like doing electronic circuit design and then like working on getting some other things shipped uh, later at another company. And all of it was like, I, I still thought the taco coffee or like autonomous aircraft potential was pretty exciting, but the regulatory environment was just too like weird and unsettled huh, interesting. that I didn't want to like take my career in that direction at the time. Interesting. And then, so what changed? Well, we have drone regulations now. So like well, really, really okay. honestly, like, is your podcast like a regulations podcast? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no but, we, but, but we are nerds and yeah. we will go deep on also, like, anything. When, when did the regulations pass and why? Like what made people like woke? I remember very clearly there was a congressional mandate to write drone regulations that was supposed to pass, I think, in September of 2015. Oh, okay. Date came and went. Something came out of it for a while. There was an exemption called Section 333, which is where you could be like, I'm a very serious oil and gas company and we'd like to use this cutting edge technology to like inspect our such and such. And you'd get these one off approvals. Um, yeah, a lot of people went into like uh, data collection, which is a.k.a. taking photos with drones just right. for the purpose of like getting the exemption uh, for like, you know, whatever the early like photographing real estate companies. Then after that, we got the rule that we have now, which is the USFAA's uh, part 107, which actually created a provision that allows you to fly commercially and collect money for your work, which, you know, before that was just a kind of a gray area. And I think that was 2017. So like it's all that's coming together. So what does that allow you to do? As a, if you've got a drone, what, what can you do with it? And what, what kind of businesses can you build on autonomous aircraft? Yeah, you can fly no higher than 400 feet above the ground, okay. uh, or sorry, not above the ground, above uh, the surface, which, you know, includes above like the, the top of the structure. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. You can fly within visual line of sight and you are allowed to get paid for your work. You may not fly over people who haven't given consent. Uh, and, oh, because photos, right? Or right. Yeah. Largely the work is photos. And I am pretty sure it's pretty explicit still. You may not uh, move any cargo for hire. Just, uh, just saying. All right. Cargo. So, so those being legal documents or serving people that would not work or no. So yeah, no we, oh, that's a bummer. We, we may not classify the lobster as cargo. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a passenger. It's a I, passenger. I strongly yeah, it's a passenger. advise against trying to skirt FAA regulations. <laughs> <laughs>
And so were you working with regulatory bodies to try to figure out what the right way to regulate this was? Or was it, I guess there are other folks in the industry that are trying to figure all this out? Yeah, and it's an ongoing conversation. You know, I, th- I think it's interesting that as a even as a young person, you were accepting the need for regulation. What's it like as a technologist to have to go deal with regulation? I think this is an, a very interesting question. You know, I, I originally, because I got into like the circuits thing, I think it was very clear to me that, you know, best practices are a thing to know about. And I just felt like, you know, early on when I was young, that there ought to be something that I didn't know how it worked yet. Uh, so, you know, maybe I was a little timid at the time, but that was my outlook was informed by the you know professional standards of, you know, more the electrical engineering side. Right. That you've got a, that, that there should be a prescribed best practice. There should be a prescribed way to do things better. Yeah. I think that that was, you know, my sense, my understanding, my outlook of how the world worked. That's great. So it's very enlightened. I have to say, especially for, I mean, I, Jeez. I, yeah. I, feel <laughs> I like, cannot accept that adjective. <laughs> but I feel like you only come to, uh, you often come to that the hard way. I think uh, that from learning the lesson of whatever it was that needed to be right. Well, if you knew me as like a, a, a little kid, you would know I learned a lot of lessons the hard way. <laughs> okay. That's I, we want to hear more about those. We're going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with more star Simpson on the metal. On the metal is brought to you by the oxide computer company. Well, bad news. I just got back from a meeting with the attorneys. Oh boy. They are not going to let us say much in these ads. We can't talk about the customer experience today for on-premises infrastructure. So we can't do my idea to be like, are you being gaslit by your vendors? Because that's what they're doing. They're gaslighting people into thinking that these bugs only exist on one of their machines when it exists on like everyone's. God, no. They called that, I think, quote, a third rail. They must be following Jess on Twitter. I knew that that was a bad idea to let the lawyers follow Jess on Twitter. (laughs) Uh, They also said we can't talk about public cloud customer experience. Oh, come on. We can't talk about the rapacious bandwidth pricing? I mean, it's practically criminal. No, can't talk about the unit economics of that at all. Can we use the word criminal with respect to public cloud vendors? Definitely not. Oh, boy. What can we do? Well, they did say they gave us a statement we can use, which is... Are you going to read from it? Oxide Computer Company is building something that should help some people. Well, that seems very direct. Come on. Can we at least send them over to Oxide.Computer? We can. We can. The other bit of bad news is all the lawyers were there in the meeting. Oh, wait a minute. Not just the cheap one, but the expensive one? Yeah, they were all there. So we paid a fortune to get this terrible ad. Oh my God, please, listener, go to Oxide.Computer and learn what we're actually doing. All right, we're back. We were talking about lessons learned the hard way. We love lessons learned the hard way. What were some of the lessons you learned the hard way? <laughs> well, no parent gets a guide to parenting, but if you were to be able to write one for me in retrospect, it would include don't tell me, star, don't tell little star not to mix electricity and water and not provide any explanation. Whoa, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Okay, so you lived. Clearly. I did, I did. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler yeah. alert, you're alive. So what happened? Oh, I mean, I did a bunch of things that were extremely dumb, but like largely due to like having asked when told that I was, uh, I asked why not and was just told, well, just don't do it. And so everything from, I remember collecting like an enormous quantity of dead double A or or C batteries, actually. I think I remember like harvesting them out of the stereo after like, <laughs> I ran out. And um, when I had enough, to so you have to picture this in your mind picture like the this like barrel battery like the alkaline battery format right it's it's a cylinder right and so if you want to make a circuit of batteries so that like you're going to connect two batteries contacts to each other and another one and another one and you're just going to add a little bit of angle until it makes a big loop because Ooh, I knew okay. about the idea of circuits. <laughs> That's a lot of batteries. That's That's a huge amount of batteries. The ones are lot. very chunky. Yeah, they're like, very chunky. Yeah. So I collected enough that I could make a circle out of batteries. <laughs> you know, it's like a, like a magic rune or something. Like I was like, yeah. I don't know, but the circle seems like an important it's like shape. It's like a power wheel. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I've got to see what happens. And I collected all these batteries and I was like laying them out on the carpet and like making a little like divot in the carpet fabric to like get the battery not to roll and like all this. And like, I was like just a few battery lengths short of being able to complete it. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm so close. I'm going to get a conductive material of some kind, like a, like a paperclip. And I unbent a paperclip and I was like, I'm almost 
kind of connect it. And as soon as I'd connected that like unbent paperclip wire across it, it like glowed orange and white hot. Right. And I'm holding it between my little oh my fingers. God. Oh, <laughs> my God. oh 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 my God. Uh, so that happened. Um, I, that is terrifying. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I would assume if you, because you probably had like 30 C batteries. Something like that. Right? That's gotta be enough. That's That's, I mean, it's definitely enough to start a fire. Nearly dead uh, yeah, batteries. Right. Yeah, I just, it glowed. And, and then I like threw the paper clip, right. of yeah. course. Fortunately, I think the air was able to cool it before it like hit the ground. <laughs> and then my fingers had like two stripes across them. Right. Oh. Secondary degree burns. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, did you have the thought process of like, now that would be a lot more fun with much bigger batteries. Ooh. I guess my take was like, okay, now I know what happens on that, that is, one. God, that is such a, a great way. I feel like I don't, I never learned the lesson that easily. I've always got to be like, all right, let's make it like much bigger. It was not the only <laughs> one. <laughs> it was not the only time. <laughs> all right. So well, yeah. Okay, what, <laughs> what next? I mean, a really, I, in retrospect, I think like scary one, dumb one that fortunately didn't turn out worse was I also knew that lightning was electricity. And I remember my mom was like, yeah, lightning, um, metal and water is bad. And so like, I was like, but what happens? And so <laughs> we're taking our entire recycling out to the yard <laughs> and like during a thunderstorm, just standing around waiting to see yeah, what okay. would happen. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Time to come. Time to, somebody needs to explain to Star how this thing works. <laughs> to come inside. It needed a better explanation. It didn't need a better explanation. Like, I agree. You yeah. need to know why. I yeah. did need to know why. I needed to know why. I was so disappointed that nothing happened. <laughs> okay, thank God. <laughs> wow. yeah. I'm so sorry to my mom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I know we're all. And to be clear, I was like six. You know. Six. <laughs> well, now I'm much more appreciative of your plush electronics right. learning set. This is a real problem in people's lives that I was trying to solve. <laughs> I, and and I, I saw that. So uh, can I do? That's the name of the yep the company we made to uh, be a kit for learning about electronics. Yeah, it looked really interesting. Thank and, you. And certainly with kids that are under the age of six, I'm much more predisposed to trying to get those in their hands oh. versus the all the batteries starting to disappear in the house. <laughs> yeah, I had a bunch of theories about why it'd be good to make like large, directly representational objects that could like let you tinker. I was also definitely scratching a very like fresh itch of my right. own. Yeah, like, right. Well, great. I'm glad that didn't turn out worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the right way to do this? You know, um, how old are your kids? Uh, two, three and five. Oh my goodness. So the five-year-old's trying to get excited about electronics. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Very pleasing ages from a Fibonacci perspective. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that is. That's so it's, it's true. It's true. It's true. Uh, Steve Fortune does not have two one-year-olds to go with it. <laughs> that, 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 that's what he would need. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the five-year-old, I think, could be safely trusted with electronics. But the, uh, I, I think, I don't know. How do you, Andrew? No, she got her first set, started to play around with, uh, you know, taking a battery, getting a loop created, getting a wheel flying. And oh, that's, oh, that's awesome. A little pinwheel. Her first starter set. Way more useful than just like straight waste heat through a paperclip. <laughs> yeah, I might have connected a circuit with a paperclip myself back in the day. Saw the same white hot reaction. Yep. I recall as playing with the paperclip, it's around the outlet that that, that, that gets the uh, attention of the parents. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the one that just make sure they're in the same hand. So you don't have it in two hands. Yeah. It's the keep one hand in your pocket. That's my, my father's fun. Yeah, I'm saying. really jealous of kids who can look up what happens when you mix electricity with various things on YouTube now. It's like uh, if any kids are listening to this, it's it's a whole other world. <laughs> it is, but then they want to replicate. They it. want to, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, they want to. That you know. didn't stop me from wanting to do the scissor lift thing. I was just going to say because you didn't look up scissor lift accidents. I looked up tutorials. Yes, well, right. Yeah, you need to Google accidents, and then your disposition <laughs> changes a little bit. So, in terms of learning lessons as an engineer, when you were further along, in terms of the with aeronautics software with with, with avionics, obviously the failure modes are much more acute or can mm -hmm. be. How do you deal with those kinds of problems and making sure that I'm sure you've had some some horror stories? I actually don't have horror stories. I think that safety critical engineering is a like really good topic that I'm glad to live in an era where a lot of people have made a lot of discoveries and there are good lessons available to be learned. I'm also a like full scale glider pilot now. So I fly planes that don't have engines, wow. which pretty esoteric hobby, but uh, really rewarding. It's like a really beautiful, you know, to go way to go experience nature. Yeah, it must be amazing because it's it must be it's so quiet. Yeah, but it's brought me into contact with like, you know, talking to other people in aviation and sort of there's a lot of effort put into like understanding what goes wrong, why things go wrong and how to mitigate those things. So I've just got to ask you about 737 Max then what your take is on. I mean, it's it, it, it's such an interesting fiasco. How does one avoid in one's developing one's own software I'd say as a software engineer, I look at the 737 Max and I'm like, I feel that this is like a move fast, break things culture. 
infecting an aircraft company, which is a very bad idea. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Uh, oh, and I'm actually slightly reticent to comment on the Mac specifically because, you know, I feel that I'm maybe one among the peanut gallery. I couldn't have as much information. Oh, you're, you're in the, oh, we're all in the peanut gallery on this, aren't we? Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, feel like that, that doesn't, let, doesn't stop me anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I think it's obviously an enormous tragedy. And, you know, I, I can't really feel anything besides completely heartbroken that it happened. Um, and I think that, you know, pretty intense lessons have been learned that I continue to, you know, I hope will continue to impact, you know, the world of aviation where it's, uh, you know, people, you know, travel are in the hands of the people doing the engineering. I know it will. It already has. Well, I think the kind of the irony is that when we first started using software in safety critical roles, there was a lot of concern that we would have software related defects that would cause loss of life. And it basically wasn't true for a long time. We did, you, you can't really, I mean, there was the Airbus crash at the, the Paris Air Show, but there basically was not a lot of software. Software was not at root for loss of life, loss of property. And it's, it's interesting that, that I mean, and, and as you say, tragic, that when we really should know much better, we now have software has begun to emerge as a failure mode here. I mean, it's obviously much more complicated than software. There's a whole bunch of things that broke down there. Well, one thing I do see here is that we are at the cusp of a new era in aviation, I think, where, you know, we've been increasing the level of, you know, sort of classic automation, which are like uh tools to reduce pilot workload, which is, you know, sort of making things slightly more automated or having slightly more software, you know, involved. But I think that, you know, so too, as we're seeing a lot of debate about how to roll out uh, maybe self-driving vehicles elsewhere, I think that there's a, there's a level of autonomy in flying gadgets that I want to see the opportunity to field in test and field in use in a risk mitigated way. Yeah. You know, I think I think we actually do need to do more work. Absolutely. Because it's not happening right now in yeah. in in vehicles, certainly. I mean, is that so? I'm not familiar. Well, I mean, I, from my perspective, I mean, the fact that you've got this thing that is that is called an autopilot that is clearly not an autopilot. I must be in a bubble because all I hear about is like the, how to deal with the safety critical factors. <laughs> well, no, I, mean, I, I think that just in terms of the Tesla autopilot, Tesla autopilot is not an autopilot. Mm. But it is actually really good having like written in one. I, it's I don't like know really so good. much about that. But. The problem is it's not an autopilot. Right. Okay, it's, fair, it, fair. It's a pilot assist. Yeah. Autopilot being something where like you can just go to sleep. It is not self-driving. It yeah, exactly. Okay, right, it's, right. it's not self-driving. And it's like, well, if you read all of the fine print, it's not self-driving. It's like, just, you call it an autopilot. I'm really into bicycles. So please, all of you don't sleep in your car while it's moving. Right. <laughs> and don't play yeah. video games and Jeez. don't right. read well, that, newspapers. Yep. And But I mean, I think the use case that people appreciate about it is when they're in like bumper to bumper traffic and the vehicle will actually move forward and stop. And Can we move to sort of like a clean sheet view of like what I, here's what I want. Okay. I'm into the idea of autonomy in vehicles, but I don't think I really need it to get me around town. Yep. The place I want it because I live in LA and I've come up to the Bay area. I've driven a few times. I just want like a tractor front end that I can like attach to my car. That's just going to take me up by five. It doesn't need to do anything. No turns doesn't need right. anything yes. specific. Yes. I just want the long haul to be the long oh, yeah, haul. Yeah, yeah, makes yeah. So much more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a romantic allure to replacing humans. And so we want to replace them everywhere, but yeah, it's the long haul up I five. And that's also where you can commercially for commercial trucking, it's like you actually don't want someone who's sleep deprived at the wheel. You want someone. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Plus, there's less factors like bicyclists, humans crossing Snow. the street, whatever. Yeah. But you're back to sleeping in the cab. But there you could actually solve the problem. Like you can solve the problem on the, you know, from the grapevine to Tracy. Right. Yep. You can solve that problem. Like that is actually a solve. That feels. Well, that is where autonomous trucking a lot of the, lot of the efforts is. are right now. It is. But I feel like we are not culturally focusing on that use case enough. Hey, it came to mind as one where I think it would be a pretty direct hit in terms of like convenience in my life and, uh, you know, one that I'd be pretty into, you know, and I don't even care if it's like my car with its wheels on the road. I mean, put me on one of those like, um, what's the like the truck that carries all the yeah. car, like a car, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, or like maybe this oh, yeah, ultimately yeah. devolves a little bit into being kind of like a train, a ferry, you yeah. know, like I get off the <laughs> car and like, like a train. Yeah, like yeah. you know, they have these um, semis that get linked up into these really long assemblies That's right. in Western Australia where there are not a lot of people yeah, or road right, hazards right, right. that they call yeah, like yeah. truck trains, you know, yeah. like you could have like a car for the people and then the car for the cars and <laughs> Well, so this That's is a really dope. interesting point that you're making That's about dope. about meeting the world where it is. 
as opposed to demanding that one change the world around a particular innovation. You know, because what you're basically saying is like, look, we're not going to, we, we don't need to replace humanity for all personal transportation. Well, I don't know if we are or aren't. I can't make a strong statement about that. I just admire like, let's just see how we can make the world actually, well, how we can improve it as opposed to. Yeah, I think you called me an optimist earlier, but I, I think did. I'm a bit of an optimizer, right? Like, it's kind of, kind of, kind of uh, what's the word? Kind of exhausting. I'm like, you know, this this thing could be slightly better in this one particular way, and people are like, "Star, it's fine, it works." Can, you know, move on. Okay, can so sure you've got some stories of some things that you obsessively optimized when everyone else thought I it was mean, good enough. We love optimizing. I mean, right? I mean, <laughs> Jess will definitely want to hear some if you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there in the category of things that were like too much work, but that were like an awesome vision. Come to light. Like I remember once I, I thought I was going to get really into drafting, which is a particular type of drawing that like you draw 3D objects with perspective as they are. And I, you know, in order to practice my drafting skills and in order because I was on a kick at the time about like transparent interfaces, I sat in my kitchen and I drew drawings of the contents of every cabinet. And then I put those drawings on the front of the cabinet so that you could sort of see what was in the game. It was like a tangible label with no text, you know, no like (laughs) internationalized by default, you know, and it was really ridiculous. But like people were like, yeah, it's the first see through refrigerator door. Yeah, it was like you could have just used glass, but you know, and I'd press people and be like, is it better? And they're like, yeah, it's uh, sure. (laughs) (laughs) That's dope. That is great. That's a total over optimization. (laughs) Great. Yeah. I can see that you would people walk in, you'd be like, look at this. Isn't this amazing? People are like, are you, is everything okay? I just want to make sure that like, (laughs) now I don't have to give you a like rundown on how the kitchen works. You can see for yourself. You don't have to search through drawers. That is great. Well, I, and I think uh, taking, I mean, kind of taking a fresh approach is so important for so many of these of these problems. Yeah, I think I maybe have learned to tone down or focus my targets a little better. I feel like toning down should not happen. I agree. Yeah, I think that it's, you, you got to turn it up. You can't grow to say like it's a, it's fine. It's okay. Like the kitchen's fine. Like go As work on something. Who has like meticulously labeled every single cable that I own? Cables are really worth labeling. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean. It's worth going above and beyond. I'm just saying like having the impulse and tying it to looking for something where you're going to get like a good reward for the effort is like, uh, that's my new thing. Yeah. I think that, that you should actually cultivate that, that kind of obsessiveness can be, I I think, especially as one gets older, you temper that with wisdom, but that, that obsessiveness is great. That's that, that's such, that's such an emotional power. Can I learn a lesson about obsessiveness here? Are there like positive, you know, targets that other people here have uh, trained their obsession on? I feel like Jess is very positively obsessive. Yeah. And I I like just let it. I mean, I like I there is no shame when it comes to like labeling cables or organizing other shit. I mean, like, yeah. And I think it's it's so terrific to appreciate the results of that. I'm also practical when it comes to other people not appreciating it. (laughs) Like I'll appreciate it, but other people don't have to. I might force no, that's it true. upon you all uh, at times. That's true. You know, I got to say, I'm surprised <laughs> that more people don't use more checklists in everyday life. Okay. You guys are all just stunned no, right now. No, 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 no. So no, people, I was just no, reflecting on, I use checklists for checklists, oh, which yeah. is not very useful. Wait, how so does I don't that get work? To the, the end result okay. of getting through the checklist you of the checklist. for checklist. But yes. Like, did we do the X checklist? Yeah. Kind of just need to like execute on the first checklist. Huh. I don't know how people survive without checklists, actually. Yeah, no, I'm a big checklist person. It's nice because it feels like you, you need that, like that positive reward that you're making progress. Yeah. Especially when you're working on a hard problem. Um, so, yeah, how do you use checklists? Well, I don't mean like to-do lists, but I mean, you know, like for simple oh, stuff. Oh, fair like, enough. Yes. Okay, because okay. I was thinking yes. of my to-do list for to-do lists. You, no, you're talking like in the aviation sense of like actually like making sure the flaps are down and... So, yeah, that type of checklist. Yeah. Like, you know. No, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> so I expand on that because I totally agree. Oh, I don't know. I mean, like, I think probably the first one I really did was like packing checklist. Like yeah. if I traveled and I was like, oh, I really wish I had, you know, whatever, then I actually kept running checklists for stuff like that. But I, I totally agree. And I, you know, early in my career, I felt frustrated that uh, people would, we, we had a uh, working on the, the operating system. People would break the operating system for preventable reasons. And it's like, why do we not have a checklist that has 45 things on it? And you've got to go check them all off before you actually integrate. So break that down for me. What do you mean break the operating system? So, I mean, with any complicated body of software, there's obviously lots of things that you have to remember, right? Lots of things you have to keep track of. Did you test this? Did you test that? Did you test this other thing? Did you, have you thought about the ramifications of this or of that or of, and a a lot of that just felt like it was 
exhaustive. There was just too much to remember. But a lot of it was, it was knowable. We can know this list and we could enumerate it. You can, it, yes. So this is yeah, like software tests now. Right. I mean, if you, if you can know it and you can enumerate it, well, one, you should automate it. But even when you've got a human in the loop and you do, when you're integrating software, you have a human in the loop. A human is, is deciding like it is time to integrate the software. And yes, you want to automate that to support it, but you need to know. And I, that's where our checklist, I think is, that's where I've used. Checklists. So do you actively regard tests as checklists? It could be. Yeah, I think it depends on. Yeah, would do you? I think we, we ask the questions already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does this table not turn? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of like accumulating data about easy, preventable, simple mistakes, I really, really, really love procedural you know, things to go through to see if you've done the right thing or, you know, one thing I'm really proud of, actually, we use checklists really heavily at the company, you know, everything from like before takeoff to like even just building the aircraft. Yeah. And we just got through a build and like, finally, we've learned enough about doing this that like put it together, turned it on and like no fiddling, you know, like no, like, ah, is this like left or right? Or like, does this go up or down? And like, I was just like, nope, I followed the instructions. We turned it on and it worked. And I'm like, well, so proud. That That's is dope. great. Awesome. So can you talk about the technical details? So what is your current company? What are you guys currently building? And yeah, talk about the technical details of that. Cause I think that's a, that's a very important lesson. We build autonomous aircraft with the goal of forwarding goods and equipment cargo strictly with nobody on board. That's cool. So mm. th this is, th I mean, this is, uh, you, the vision you've had for a long time to coming to real fruition. It's one of them, but it's right. the result of like a lot more in-depth thought about kind of what's valuable in aviation. What do aircraft kind of, what jobs do they have? Like, you know, looking at the object is kind of having a, its own role uh, that like people find valuable to do. And then kind of looking at the edges and saying, so what aren't we doing right now? Because we can't, because of, you know, that changes when you go autonomous. Interesting. So yeah, what are some of the things that you found in terms of some of those opportunities and so we, you, you, the best way to model what we're doing is we're, um, we're supporting additional operations that users who would otherwise interact with helicopters for moving cargo payloads might want done uh, in, a, in a more efficient way. And you're building the aircraft to do that as well. We are. Yeah. That's exciting. Uh, it's, it's really the easiest way to prove out what we're doing. And so describe, so in terms of, of the, as you were developing the, the checklists and developing the kind of the platform for that. What, what were some of the engineering challenges that you had? Oh, I mean, so this is actually not uncommon in like a first build of an aircraft where, you know, you have aerodynamic control surfaces that have to like go up or down depending on whether you want to turn left or right. And for whatever reason, I find it pretty, you know, difficult to put myself in like the reference frame and say like, okay, this one's going up. That means that the counter reaction is like this thing's going down. So that means like, and then like, okay. And then like this way means turning that way, you know, like, that's one of the ones uh, where you have to get that right. And just making a visual checklist for that was like saved so much effort. It was so much better than just trying to work it out in your head every time, right? Which is, like, I think, something that a checklist is exactly perfect for. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Because a lot of those are like, or at least with planes, are super not intuitive. It's the opposite that you would think it they would They might be. not be intuitive. Yeah. And it's just a million times better not to say, I think I got it right. That's, that's really cool. I mean, obviously you guys, you're engaged in safety critical engineering. Well, um, we are involved in doing engineering with things that fly, but because we don't fly over people, we don't fly uh, with people on board. You know, if we were to see it come down in test, that would probably just, you know, at best rumple the landing gear, not further damage other than something we could replace pretty easily. Oh, that's cool. But it just your disposition, though, is, is so strongly towards, seems towards building safe things that, I, I mean, I just contrast. You Why like, not? I mean, like, I'm sitting here, you know, writing a bash script or whatever. It's like the, okay, the, well, the, the level of discipline is. I don't want a test to go badly for dumb right, reasons. Right, right, of course. Basically. So, and, and so how do you prevent that? How do you have a culture that prevents that, a system that prevents that? I mean, I think that the, the phrase that I really love is to make haste slowly. This was a quote from like a... I think a Roman military leader, you know, it was like, you want to go as quickly as you can without being hasty, I think ultimately. And when you make dumb mistakes, you don't check your work with something that's going to leave the surface of the earth. It's pretty easy to 
not find out what you were trying to find out or not get the thing to work correctly as you hope for simple reasons. And I get, I'm so frustrated. There's so much work that goes into building anything that like, I want to say like, oh, okay, like, you know, this big thing was as we expected, not like, well, who knows? Because, uh, you know, left was right and right was left. Like it's just it's a huge waste of time. Totally. How do you work up to that so you know that the big thing, when it turns on, it's going to turn on correctly? I mean, you've got to have a lot of small things that you that you test. Yeah, I would say this doesn't necessarily come naturally to me, but we have a pretty good practice of like capturing and documenting and building up the docs to support that as we go. And it just makes life so much better, so much more efficient. It lets us move so much more quickly. To have things well documented and communicated. Yep. So yeah. that, you know, the first time we built it, I was like, okay, this is what was tricky. So next time that's like clearly written about how, like how to navigate this little like narrows. Oh, oh interesting. Cool. Yeah. And so is this, is this in the spirit of kind of technical documentation or more kind of experiential documentation? Of like it's here? both technical documentation, it's pack lists and it's checklists for, you know, actual procedure and checklists for, you know, what data we're recording, if it needs to be manually recorded. And, you know, it's basically... I strive for this culture of efficient, you know, I don't want to use the word bureaucracy, but kind of like light touched, right? Like the procedure is meant to support getting the job done and no more. Right. Yeah. I mean, you want to make haste slowly, as you say. I mean, you, you want to be sure that you're rigorous and you're still moving at pace. Rigorous is a great word. Yeah, it's one of our values. Rigor and urgency come into tension. Rigor and urgency. Yeah, so we've got our, we've got 15 values at Oxide and we ask people, to take two of our values and ask when they have come in the tension for them. And the most common is the, rigor and right. urgency. Rigor is one of our values. Very and engineering. Urgen- urgency is another one of our Absolutely. values. And that's the, I think rigor and urgency and the tension between rigor and urgency. That's a tension that we see a lot in engineering. I mean, and how you do you navigate that tension, right? Because you've got to be, I, I think in our belief, your belief obviously is that rigor has to win out. Yeah. You don't want to miss steps. I mean, and I think it's, it's hard, it's hard to do otherwise now that we have this practice. Right. Well, in terms of like once you kind of set a culture of that. Of documenting and of yeah, logs. If people come in, they, you know, we've got a, we got one of our founding engineers, Robert Mustaki, has, is a, is a terrific note taker in meetings. No, he like He's makes amazing. me feel self-conscious. I, I know, I know. Okay, can we just talk about that for <laughs> Wait, a second? Sorry, awesome. sorry. We're going to have a therapy session really quickly. I, I, I mean, I get total like meeting imposter syndrome. The bar's been set high. The bar's been set super high. But it's w- where in every meeting you take these notes that are then send them out to everyone. And boy, it's amazing, though, to have that and to have that culture get set and that expectation. So get set. I, I, was, I super appreciate that. I have the world of respect for like people who know take at that level. Um, we make it work. But like, you know, when you don't have people who are necessarily like process naturals, how do you do it? Yeah. So how do you do it? Or how do you make it lightweight? And one thing we do that I think has been really good for us, you know, capturing and remembering like, the hardest thing to do for us is like you go out and we actually field test with a real prototype and you know, you can say like, well, I think what I saw was this, right? Like, I think this is the thing we need to adjust for next time. And you leave the field, you go to the office and you're like, okay, so like, here's what I saw and here's what, and that might shift as you go from the on, you know, in situ moment to like later trying to remember like what the other guy said, like looked like it needed to be adjusted. So we uh, do post-flight debrief where like we kind of just do a huddle and talk through, you know, what did you see? How did it go? How did it feel? You know, what do you think we need to improve for next time? If anything, and I'm really fastidious because it's high leverage and easy for me to do is like we get the that transcribed and captured. That is, the, the I, I was just going to ask. So yeah. you, you have a huddle where people are speaking, reviewing, reviewing, but it's all oral and optionally all oral and optionally even interrogating sort of like, right, okay, exactly. so like, tell me, did this did like, did see? it seem like, yeah, or something? Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. And then, so it's a conversational, it's conversational, it's verbal and it's recorded. And it's recorded that's cool. and, yeah, and that's then transcribed good. later. Yeah. And then that makes it possible to refer to or search. And crucially to me, it's still light enough because you're going to talk about what happened afterward, no matter what. So yeah. it's, it's a very natural thing for people. Yeah. So we did this, what we were raising a lot of money to start a company. And we, the three of us would do this. We would take these oral notes together mm. and Going, Not transcribe them later, although that would be interesting. That, that would be, don't you, ooh, yeah, bite your tongue. That wouldn't be, that would be dangerous. But they were 
incredibly valuable. I mean, let's be real. I work with people. There are on the record notes and off the record. Off the record <laughs> you know, and usually, it, usually it's just a little thing, but, but, you know, an extra thing comment. was really right. interesting for that is to go back and re-listen to some of that stuff. And you're just like, oh man, I'd forgotten all these details that were really important details. Mm. And I have, that was such an interesting experience for us that I have been so tempted to do that in from an engineering perspective as well. And we should just do that. That is yeah, such no, a good idea. Really we cool. don't do it all the time. We don't do it for everything. But I, I strive to mitigate the thing where someone's like, I'm really sure that they said that like the, we, you know, this part needs to be heavier. And yeah. I'm like, no, they said it needs to be lighter. You know, and like this way, we don't have to have that debate. We can refer to what was actually said. Go and, back to the tape. You know, yeah, for the, the, for the, the critical moments. And then I think also not having it be audio is actually a big deal because you can sort of like scroll or search or, you know, those. Yeah, those having, having it transcribed. Yeah, that's that's, a, re that's, that's a really good idea. Especially postmortems. Postmortems and just, well, all also, just like when you've got, there's so many of these design discussions where the other thing that I that I find that I I hate myself for doing and have tried to actively undo in myself, but when I going back and re-listening to some of this stuff, I will have an observation that I want to make, but someone else is speaking, and I will someone else will say something, and then I will make the observation that I wanted to make, and the reality is my brain was not processing both of those at the same time which is a long way of saying like, I wasn't listening. you know what I mean? It's like, I was not talking, but I was, there was a point that was made. You were waiting to talk. You were waiting. waiting to talk. Yeah. And there's a point that was made that was a valuable point. And I will re-listen to it. And I know that I've missed the point and you realize how much, even when you think you're being attentive, the level of attentiveness, you actually have to re-listen. I have to re-listen to the same thing three or four times. Well, maybe this really... way you could read instead of, you know, re-listening. Yeah, totally. yeah, exactly. it, it's a different channel. And I'd say like nine times out of 10, we don't end up like really deeply reviewing again. Right. But it's like, you know, it's there. How much audio That's is cool. it? Oh, it's some um, handful of minutes. Three, okay. Three, so four transcribing minutes. it is just listening and typing that in. There's no, well, uh, no you, can also, you can also use software to that. I do mean, you use software? Yes. Okay. How, how, how <laughs> accurate is that? It's accurate enough. Okay, because I see some weird things on YouTube. No, That's no, no. I mean, saying. no, like, look, like, you know, but, but for the purposes of what you're talking oh, yeah, no, about, no, no, where, it's, where, fair, where it's, it's just like, you know, I think we need to adjust, you know, this control surface or what have you. Like, well, like I, I, I would even argue that it's or... crucial that we use transcription to get it done because otherwise it's not high leverage, right? Otherwise yeah, it's like yeah, 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 yeah. one right. second per second reliving, right? Like no, <laughs> it, no one has time yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah, no, that's super true. The other thing I would say is that for a company that touches a build process that we own in-house, right? So for one thing, there's organizational learning there. And for two, I think capturing SOPs, I can't believe that this is me as an adult, like this is what I talk about, but like right. capturing the SOPs is critical for scaling. Yeah. End of story, right? If you can't hand off a process, then like, what are you doing? You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and getting that thing written down and thought about rigorously. And I'm sorry to not be able to move on from the the recording of those discussions. I, no, <laughs> totally I, don't, cool. I, no, I don't feel it's done in the industry. I feel that the, it's fair. and I feel that if we had not done that during the race, I don't know that I, that, I mean, I've just seen how incredibly valuable it is. But have you heard of other folks doing this? Maybe this happens. We get a lot of, when we demo, we get a lot of attention because we openly use checklists. And right. this is even within a field of people, you know, doing engineering, building stuff. It's like, I think it doesn't come naturally. Yeah. That's interesting because in light, I feel like check checklists are a huge thing, right? Like before takeoff people and People come landing from all different and, backgrounds. So, yeah. you know, it's like a funny thing that there's a high number of pilots on my team. And so like, there's a huge familiarity with like the checklist thing is ingrained. And also, honestly, also how we speak to each other is really informed by like the kind of intense radio training you get, well, like radio work. I use, you know? uh, use Niner a lot. Actually, I do. I do use. I do use copy and affirmative. We're not. We're not. I, I, copy. Yes. Copy. Niner. Niner. No, okay, like, niner is a joke. But I feel. I use affirmative. I use affirmative. Yeah. Affirmative like and negative. Niner. Affirmative and negative are there there's a are, reason there we use affirmative and negative and not between yes no. like I heard you and I'll do it that matter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like yeah. neither one is a wrong answer to give, but it's like yeah, copy. Just different. Copy. Yeah. So yeah. when you hear me say copy, this is yeah. No, it's it's. And then the the uh, the alternative is Wilco, which is like will comply. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. I don't no. think we really actually say Wilco though. Mm. Yeah. And you don't say Niner. Say Tommy I Boy reference. I would not say that unless I was really in a uh, context where that was appropriate. Did I yeah. just hear a Niner in there? You can't just Niner people. You can't, no. you can't, you can't just Niner people. <laughs> you can't just Niner people. Well, like, so I'm totally Jess gonna do was that. getting it on the night. Niner, I, or or and then and then also are, are, are do you are do you bra the reason bra is because Charlie Delta people radios are bad, right? And so like in in general, yes, you can't right. really under you yeah. can't believe they're not these like nice podcast microphones you right. guys have. They're like radios don't really record what you're saying or don't really transmit necessarily that well. The culture doesn't depend on the hardware being awesome, right? So it's not just actually it's not just Niner, which is like uh, the 
the end sound is to differentiate it from something else, right? right. But they also sometimes it's a tree instead of three. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Because mm. the th sound gets lost. That's crazy. Huh. On the Metal is brought to you by Oxide Computer Company. Well, I got to tell you, the podcast has been more successful than I originally anticipated. Hey, that's great. Yeah, there's, there's good news. Folks are uh, are liking the content. There has been some negative feedback, though. What, from the podcast? The podcast is great. These interviews are amazing. The podcast themselves, folks, are liking. I've gotten a couple emails specifically calling out the repetitive ad content oh, that's we, driving them crazy. We only recorded three ad rolls. I know, we got a lot of ad breaks. They ah. were reminding me in email about the fact that there's only been three ad rolls that they've had to hear again and again and again. Oh my God, we're so sorry. I mean, it's a great podcast. You don't want to ruin it with repetitive ad rolls. Yeah, so I think it's something we should keep an eye on. Okay, so in the meantime, we should just tell people to go to oxide.computer, I guess? Yeah, that's, that's all we need. To All do. right, sign up from the mailing list, and then we'll just like, we'll, we'll shut up. And hey, if you've got any feedback on the ads, like definitely send that to us, right? Sure, we're getting it. All right, sounds good. Back to the show. I, I'm an avid Channel 9 listener from. Oh my God. All right, I know. Uh, so cool. Hard eyes. Uh, the, okay, you know, Channel 9 was the historically United allowed you to listen to air traffic control. I'm hearing Rhapsody in Blue right now. Oh, like this oh God, so am I. Oh, my God, Gershwin. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, welcome that, to the Friendly Skies. I, I welcome to the Friendly Skies. And, yes. and I, God, there was a great United ad from the 80s, I think, where, you know, I just heard from one of our top customers today, and he's going to, you know, no longer going to be one of our top customers. Have you seen this ad, Steve? Yeah. And where he starts handing out, it's like, so you know what we're going to do? We are going to visit all of our customers. So he starts calling out names and he's handing out mm -hmm. United tickets <laughs> and, and then Rhapsody in blue is playing. And I know I, I, and I, United can abuse me basically arbitrarily and I'm still a United Patriot, which is ridiculous, but because I, I love the romance of aviation and I love listening to channel nine. Channel nine was a way to tune into the air to air traffic while flying and listen to other pilots talking to other air traffic controllers. That's dope. Oh, which is great. And so on the in seat, like stereo. Oh, and so, you know, so you would have like, you know, United four, two, three, have a clear for takeoff. One right, one right, do not delay. I love do not delay. Do not delay is like, because in, in, in San Francisco, that means that there is someone who is actually get landing. Get moving. Yeah, get, yeah, get moving because there is, there is someone who is actually landing on the other runway that crosses. Fun one, fact, uh, SFO has more weather related delays than any other airport in the United States. That I believe. Well, Absolutely. Because the runways are so close together. Because and, the runway and, separation is not uh, enough to do parallel uh, to runway landing in instrument <sighs> conditions. And you, such you, as fog, you, which San Francisco might get a sometimes. Bit. A little bit. Although SFO is a little bit better, but the, the than than the actual San, the actual city. But San Francisco runways are so close together. They warn you when they are operating under visual conditions, just letting you know that there's an aircraft next to us. It's normal. Like this, this, <laughs> this 737 that's next to you that looks like it's about to serve you drinks. Like that's, that's fine. It's normal for, for parallel landing. I got so excited. Brilliant. I just ripped the cord out of my microphone. I am enjoying it so I know. Much. I, I get so excited. I just become, I. You know, I love the enthusiasm. It's so I wonderful know, to I, be on. Uh, you guys, you promised uh, to bring the, the on the metal spirit. And right. here we are. Okay. Very so on the metal. So you know what a Tracon is. But have you, have you ever, there's a game called the Tracon. A know, game. A game. Okay. So Tracon is air traffic control. It's what you get handed off to when you, when you travel across the country. And there was a game called the Tracon 2, which allowed you to be an air traffic controller. And then you could dial up all of these scenarios. And you do air traffic control on like O'Hare approach on a stormy day oh, goodness. with a high likelihood of, of, of pilots ignoring you. And, or cause you would have like a private plane, you have a private plane and you could set a dial where it would like not pay attention to what you just told it to do. Because it's it's a private pilot. Sometimes a little bit of, like it's a little stressful. These like oh air, aircraft God, simulation was, yeah. games, oh, so called yeah. games are like. No, <laughs> I, remember, I was playing this as like a thirteen year old, and I was gonna be like, I need to like pick up a like a smoking habit just to deal with the stress <laughs> of playing this game. I mean, it's like it's like you see why every air traffic controller. Anyway, I'm thinking back to the, like the poor kid listening to this podcast again, be like, don't follow that advice. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think yeah, the game was I don't think it was that which one it was the a circle great of batteries or the smoking <laughs> habit. There's a litany here. Smoking habit as a six year old. Uh, yeah, just because the, the stuff is super stressful, though. Magic smoke, yeah. any type of smoke, <laughs> avoid. <laughs> and do you, do you have any Channel Nine stories? Uh, I don't know. I mean, just any time we were, you know, able to fly in a big old airplane, which was super exciting to me. Then uh, I was definitely hooked up to Channel Nine when I could be. 
I feel like I missed out on like a huge portion of my childhood and I'm like I extremely stressed out about it right now. It, you know, I think it went, so pilots could- <laughs> Don't be stressed, don't be stressed. I think it was not popular you. with pilots. And indeed the um, pilots were allowed to start turning it off and on a flight that I desperately wanted to have Channel 9 on because it was a mess, the pilot had turned off Channel 9. I so see. that people couldn't hear? Yeah, you couldn't hear. Like, here's the thing. Okay, I sometimes deal with an uh, aviation uh, adjacent insurance company and their hold music. It's not music. It's actually the live radio oh, air traffic control. Because right? oh, they know hold the people right are now. into it. And so, like, I don't know. You could just record, like, pleasant air traffic control calls, you know? And, like, I would take that. Oh, I would absolutely. So, I mean, so with the, all right, a confession. I often, my phone is not in airplane mode when we're taking off because I'm listening to KS, not good. KSFO on the plane. So you can listen to KSFO. You can get all these live feeds for air traffic oh, control. Okay. And so you can listen to it as you're taking off. Just to note, you can listen to KSFO in your house, in your house exactly. on the ground yeah. and right. not in a situation where the regulations require you to put okay. your phone in your phone. <laughs> How, so does that pose a danger to the aircraft? I mean, is that a, is that a well-conceived regulation? This is a, oh, I'm so ready. This, I'm so ready. Yeah, it's an unfair question. Jess, <laughs> <laughs> did you want to answer that one? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh. I I can see why they do it. Why do they? Why but do why they do is it? it? Okay, there's, why is there's it? Some, there's, there's rationale behind it that makes sense. So, I mean, the best way to think about the FAA, and honestly, like FAA regulators have really important job and I think are, are really trying to do a good job of what they do, which is, you know, you look at the history of aviation. It's, um, you know, the case that like pilots were these like yahoos, right? Like they're strapping on like a leather skull cap and little goggles and like doing rolls or whatever, you know, like the FAA's job is to make it to people who don't have any interest in flying or aviation are kind of like don't have a worry. Right. The FAA does the worrying there. There there are outsourced aviation safety worriers. Right. Yeah. And they make sure that like aviation is unbelievably safe. It is amazing. Yep. The safe. record is incredible. Although, I mean, that's the NTSB, though, as much as the FAA. Right. Well, I mean, these are organizations that work in synchrony. You know, NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, they investigate any incidents and develop data about like what happened and why and how to like they create recommendations about how to mitigate those things. And FAA enacts the rules. So there's kind of a separation between the organizations. But I wouldn't say and that famously it's, attention, right, between the NTSB and the FAA. What do you mean? Well, so there would be NTSB would make safety recommendations that the FAA wouldn't take because it would be too expensive to implement. The famous ones being the smoke detectors in, in the cargo holds, right? Well, sure. I mean, I, I don't know that specific example, but what I what I mean is I think that there's kind of like a bicameral aspect to it. Yeah, I, that's the, that's, yeah. I, I love the NTSB. Like I'm, they keep I'm, each other in check? They try to. So famously, the NTSB felt that smoke detectors were needed in the cargo hold of passenger aircraft, and the FAA resisted it because it would have cost like 165 million bucks. And it wasn't until the value jet crash which was due to the lack of smoke detectors that the FAA then adopted the regulation. Mm. Whoa. But the, but I mean, so there's a, there is a tension, but it means like someone's got to be, someone needs to keep the other in check. Someone needs to keep the other in check. But I do. I love the NTSB. I'm not sure that they are set up quite to like keep each other in check, but I do think that they both, and especially FAA uh, have hard jobs because you're trying to navigate this like risk mitigation yeah. and create frameworks to, you know, allow other people to um, safely do things. I mean, you know, the fact that we have the rules we do is actually pretty great where like you can, you know, you have an idea for an airplane that doesn't look like anything that's ever flown before and you think you can build it, right? Like FAA rules actually allow you to build that thing to go fly it. You can't fly it over other people. Like there's, right, you know, right, 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 like right. this is actually really innovation forward in many ways, right? Like you can't take a paying passenger in your like hoopty, but you can definitely fly yourself <laughs> around <laughs> that's dope yeah and it's very i mean on the one hand there's a, there there was or has been historical attention but the other hand it's like the faa does actually has made modifications obviously a lot of modifications that are trying they're trying to balance a, it's a hard problem as you say it's like they're trying to i be, have a lot of respect for the faa's yeah. job and you know also like i mean like the vastness of the united states it right like big. it's a federal organization so any change in rules is enacted across you know, six time zones at least, right? Like it's a huge amount of area that their rules cover. And then also when you look at um, how strong the aerodynamic aviation base is in the United States, that like, it's kind of like um, 
import rules in California end up affecting product across the country because so much is imported through Californian ports, right? So if you make like an emission standard for a car, because so many of those cars are going to pass through California, basically every automaker then just makes cars that comply with California rules. So, you know, so you end up having this like huge leverage. It's like you're doing national rulemaking. So two FAA rules really govern like global Interesting. standards. So, you know, it's a, it's a really serious, serious responsibility. Well, and I think it's interesting you phrase it as innovation forward, which is really how, I mean, that's how, how we would like to have all, all regulators be. Yeah. And like my personal piece on this is like, I think that I'd like to see a lot more regulation built so that we can do more innovating, if that makes sense. Right. Like I want a checklist that will allow me to have a place I can go and fly this experiment and do these tasks with my autonomous aircraft. And I think the right thing to do for that is actually to like write more standards and you know, it does move slowly. There's a reason for that. The entrepreneur in me, of course, does get frustrated that like I can't do certain things. So, you know, all I can say is like, I, and that is with the caveat, that, like I have an enormous amount of respect for what the work involves. But this yeah. is an extremely important point, I think, that well-structured regulation fosters innovation. Can. 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 Right. Yeah. You know, the time scales are kind of rough because, you know, you have to have the organizational patience or like, you know, time Run to life. to deal with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> those uh, changes coming slowly. Like, as I mentioned, I've been sort of watching the waves on this for, you know, 2009, what's like 11 years later, right? I was like, yeah, some things have changed. There have been some positive developments, but you want to foster innovation. You want to not have these like leather cap wearing yahoos run amok, but you also like, you know, I think you do get into trouble when you're favoring organizations through the use of time scales. I love the leather cap wearing Yahoo. I'm sorry. I, I like <laughs> giving someone a ride in their hoopty. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's doing rolls. There's, doing a rolls. There's a whole visual here that I, it's kind of like, it, like oh the barnstormer. Gosh. Absolutely. I mean, it's been so cool. Like now I'm based in Southern California and like, Amelia Earhart's home field is like really close to where I am. And like oh, I'm always wow, like great. sort of like, cause you know, like the shadow of the legacy that uh, she created is like very present, you know, and so many others. And there obviously is a huge aerospace legacy in SoCal. Is that part of the oh, reason yeah. you guys are down there? There's still an enormous amount of aerospace activity, which is, that's really why I'm there is yeah, like the people, the talent, the designers, the builders, the, you know, fabrication, right? Like if you want to tap into that, LA has it. Yeah. That's cool. And, and have you read Ben Rich's Skunk Works? Have you read this? Oh, this, yeah. this is yeah. a really famous book. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's pretty galvanizing. I'm actually quite close to the former Lockheed Skunk Works plant, which is now a mall. Oh. But but they kept a tribute to the Lockheed uh, plant with like the mall has a Wait, like, it, like a Jamba Juice or something. It's like a Jamba Juice. Oh, like, like there's like a Target. There's oh like yeah, God. it's like a whole parking. But like but they have cutouts of the Lockheed like cutting edge planes, like Constellation, the oh, Blackbird, right. that are kind of like up on the sign. So there's that. On the they, okay, I need to read okay, that. Okay, so you you've, okay. You got her. Kelly it, Johnson. It, 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 was Kelly the, Johnson. Yeah. Uh, he ran the Lockheed Skunk Works, which are like turned out these amazing, air, never seen before, like performant aircraft. And uh. I think he had a quote, which is, uh, don't just wound your problems, kill them dead. Like it was like, Whoa. it's really intense. Oh, like, you would love Kelly intense. Johnson. So yep. he's an amazing person and goes to Lockheed basically, look, I want to do more interesting things. And you're going to basically let me do this with the Skunk Works. And he was known for his like, whip fast mental arithmetic of like some guy was like, well, I'm thinking of making like the tube diameter this big. And he's like, then the outlet temperature is going to be 600 degrees. And how are you going to deal with that? And the guy's like reeling in his chair. <laughs> whoa, whoa. It's and the aircraft they built. I mean, they built the U2. Just built, one thing after another. Yes, that so, was so, like so mind blowing. Fishworks is a, is okay, a, I get is it. a tip it's of the play hat on, on skunk works. works. And so well, this is a group I did within, uh, within sun, which is not doing anything. I, with, we did not, we were not making the SR 71. So I know you asked the questions, but can you explain like Fishworks? Like there's a whole in joke going on. Well, so Fishworks is a, a group that I, and I, a, a coworker of mine started to do something similar to skunk works, but for computers, the, Fish was fully integrated software and hardware, ah. and the the works was a was a tip of the hat. To, I thought the fish was like that's a hip new shell now, isn't it? Uh, oh, it? I do not use that shell. I mean, we're gonna get into a whole <laughs> thing right now. <laughs> like, you, whoop, okay, pull the car over. <laughs> she sells seashells down. <laughs> But just you will love this book, and we'll put obviously put a link to it in the show notes. And it's you know it's one of those things that's actually 
it's been one of the most influential books for me. That is right up there with Soul of a New Machine in terms of okay, influencing okay. the directory of my oh, life. Oh, those are totally mm -hmm. on the same shelf. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's good. I think if anyone is a super like uh, av geek, right, you want to get an aviation geekery. Another book I really enjoyed reading was called Who Owns the Sky, which is a history of aviation regulation. Oh, so, that sounds good. It's a short, quick book that's better than you'd guess given what the topic is. That's so <laughs> there's another one, Turbulent Skies, which uh, I want to read Who Owns the, Who Owns the Skies. That's great. Turbulent Skies is in the Sloan Technology series. Nice. But the whole era of deregulation is kind of amazing. So that's referring to the time where um, previously airlines would go to the Civil Aviation, Civil Aeronautic Board, and the fares were all set by the federal government. So, like, you want to fly from here to there, like, this airline's allowed to do it, and, like, this is what that flight will cost. Whoa, so they couldn't compete on price. Oh, no. Whoa. No. Or route. And, or route or whoa. anything. And your margin was basically how much better than the fare you could do in operating costs. And then if your, like, company was floundering, you just go to the CIB and just, like, hold out your hat. And deregulation was opening up um, routes and fares to, you know, this is where we get Southwest and Discount Airlines uh, and everything That's came nice. from there. And People's Express. and People's I mean, Express. You know, we yeah. got all sorts of bonkers airlines. And there was an explosion of airlines. And amazing, amazing, incredible, fantastic book on this topic is it's called Hard Landing. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, okay, that's good. And, and, so, and it talks about kind of like the downfall of Pan Am that came as a result. Right, absolutely. Oh, shit, Pan Am. That Pan was Am, uh, the, and I remember being with my grandfather in the Pan Am Clipper Club in, in SFO, now the United wow. Club. Yeah, he was a huge Pan Am flyer. Uh, actually, funny, in, uh, in I think 1955, he, my mother grew up in, in Saudi Arabia. He was a petroleum engineer. They offered him a lifetime membership to the Clipper Club. That's really special. For 500 bucks. Wow. In That's which is a lot of money. Which is a lot of money. But, he's, but my grandfather had this, this, this belief that like lifetime membership, always buy it. And it definitely, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was definitely, it was, it was definitely. Uh, I re another book I really liked was Sky Gods, which is specifically about Pan Am. About okay, Pan Am. Cool. Okay, I, I'm going to have to oh, read no, this. Oh, I would rank Sky Gods as like, it was interesting, but you have Hard to really be into it. it. Hard Landing and uh, Skunk Works, top of my list. Okay. Okay. Like, All right, so as long as we're talking about deregulation, I got a deregulation picture book for you. Deregulation Knockouts, Volume 1. There is no Volume 2, which is on each, it's like a book of photos of defunct airlines. What? Which if Coffee uh, table book. Coffee table book. Mm. For, for it is so delightful conversation starter conversation starter yes i mean this is like it, 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 so you've got a, all these crazy airlines that they're probably just business. waiting for more to go defunct for volume two yeah we're kind of in the post deregulation era it's that i gotta take a look at this book oh the, the, no there are they're they're great no, i mean the, i think the history of aviation is really fascinating and like there's deregulation there's also you know you look at like the history of different aircraft configurations or like good ideas that for whatever reason you know there's a very obscure one called the convert a plane that like you know i've spent more time than i should admit like being interested by which is like an aircraft that can convert from flying like an airplane to flying like a helicopter so you know <laughs> Uh, sorry, it's flying like a gyrocopter, but uh, technically. But, uh, well, that was, but the Osprey did the same thing, right? And famously was a very expensive project that ooh. took forever to get right. A uh, great book about the Osprey. Ooh! Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> this is called uh, The Dream Machine. And, okay. And there's another book called The Dream Machine, which is about JCR Licklider, and this is not, yeah, yeah, yeah. not that not book. That, uh, not yeah, because I was like, I know a dream machine. Okay, not that. Yeah, so there's, so there's, dream machine there's about two the Osprey. good books with the same title, and it really talks about just like the amount of commitment of belief the engineers who built the tilt rotors and, yeah. and vertal planes had going into that program oh that's cool because that in that program and how like took a how long much time. How was very people w went what people went through and i mean also the loss of life that right. it that oh, wow. that particular aircraft incurred it, right on its way to becoming something we have yeah it's something we have it's unclear to me how permanently successful that is versus like i mean it, it versus kind of i love course. talking about the future who could say <laughs> That's right. There you go. You know, it, it, what I, is permanently successful? Uh, I mean, I, like in the long right. run, right? You like know I, I already hate every computer is sand. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You know what? Actually, I, I find gutting though is the fact that the A380 is being taken out of service. Isn't that depressing? Is it? Is it? You don't like? You're not an A380 fan. I don't know Doesn't if it I should mean that in. like new <laughs> okay. stuff is coming. I so don't dislike like, the A380 particularly. The A380 just made a bad bet. And they they bet on hub and spoke and and, and huge planes and yeah. huge planes that didn't have extended at any longer range. I mean, I don't know. I take this like kind of one step back view about other people's <laughs> technological developments because like 
things rise and fall. And I think it's super interesting. Yeah. You know, but it's like the creative destruction of like, you know, this is an interesting idea and it joins many other really interesting ideas in the history and, of and aviation. And now it's in the pantheon of history. The, I mean, the thing that's impressive is they built it, they shipped it, like it exists. It is impressive. It flew. It flew. And if you're old, um, my mother's a long haul traveler and loves that aircraft. Is very upset. That A380. It's A380. Yeah. Because like, they, you know, they had, they can hold like. Like the reason I don't want to weigh in though is like, you know, there are people who t- put these hats on. I'm sure you see them in computing all over of like, I'm on like team Airbus versus team I don't team know what you're Boeing. talking about. No, there's no tribalism in computing. <laughs> what did no. Jess say about no, like no, shells? No. I don't think she has strong feelings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I have strong feelings for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's I'm like pro true. aircraft. That's like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. that is so, that's great. In terms of like, pro the, moving forward. how do we, why are we so prone to tribalism and technology? Because you experience the pain of using something else, I think. I mean, personally, that is where it comes from for me. Interesting. The problem for me is like, I want to be with people who share my values. And I feel like we do, these things divide into like values divides, at least in computing. I think it's not wrong to have strong values. Right. It's just too bad that we, we do, we end up, you know. God, well, you know, the thing that I really like to stay away from is that it's so much easier to tear down a technology and like the number of, you know, huge airliners that most people have built is much smaller than the number of people who might have opinions about them, you know, and it's totally. just like, yeah, yeah. Totally. ah, you know, we live in this incredible age, you know, there's like so much, I mean, like I get amazed by little things, right? Like right in front of me on the table right now, it, there are three like bottles, right? I've got my like water bottle that I always have with me. There's like a, like a water uh, bottle, like from a store. And then there's go like, just, just wants a diet Coke shame me right now. So just go ahead and do it. <laughs> there's Stand a can with. of soda. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Say it. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> go on, Justin. Brian you're is do 90% it. diet Coke. Okay. All right. There we go. And, uh, <laughs> and like all of these vessels are amazing. You could go like, I, I think I had like a little, so forgive me for people who follow my Twitter and like read this for some reason and still remember, but like I was just recently tweeting about like how incredible it is to have like fluid vessels that you can like turn upside down and trust they're not going to leak and that the liquid inside mm-hmm. is still good and like you know the pioneers of aviation they didn't have like a sports bottle with them in the plane they were just sweating yeah. you know and like thirsty you know and like maybe this is a small thing but like these these little things we take for granted are so amazing much less the big things that we have and like it's just such a like i don't know i think the world is getting better and it's also an incredible place right now. That is so, so, true. That's true. so true. That is and so true. So and I think my sickening optimist. No, 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 on no, the no, air no, no. Again. Appreciating that any of this works. Well, and also, I mean, you, you're, you're among your people because we just started a computer company, which people think is like outrageous and hard, but it's like, it's actually easier to do hardware now than it ever has been. And yet we are, have got a stronger version to it than ever when we shouldn't. It's like these things, I, I, no, I totally share. So tell me this because I'm I'm curious about this topic. People are surprised that anyone deals with hardware. Yes. Yeah. That's also why we have the podcast is also to remind people that like this stuff exists. exists. Hardware exists. exists. Yeah. 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 It's crazy because uh, I, I think that just like the upper stacks of software got so, so like people heavy, like there's so many developers and stuff like that, that like people tend to forget that like there is this underlying component. I don't know. And you're in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. I think the thing that I'm most surprised by is that, you know, we've had for a long time this management class of people who knew extremely well how to take a budget and convert it like into cutting edge, never been seen before hardware, like on a certain timeline, you know, and without like massive expenditure. That's that's like an, a skill you can gain over time. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can solve hard problems. And that, you know, it's it's something we understand reasonably well. Yeah. Like, I think that the thing that amazes me is, and I think that it's been said elsewhere, we don't understand necessarily that well, is the conversion of capital into software, you know. Well, I, and I think it, it requires a great leap into the unknown. There's uncertainty and and failures are going to happen. And th- that's very hard for people to wrap their, their minds around. Understandably, you know, you want, as, as Jess was fond of saying when we were raising money, it's like people want a done deal. They do. But and, like hardware seems so much more a, a done deal to me. Like this is the thing where I'm just sort of like it's like a physical object versus software. Um, but I don't know. I think it's I think it's just the fact that so many people these days just just like deal in SaaS. It's like software as a service, and then they don't they don't really like there there isn't. It, which is the thing is, it, and I you know I think it is part of the reason we did the podcast is to communicate to folks that actually this is more accessible than ever. It, you know, you've been involved in the open hardware movement. We think that the, the hardware is easier to make than ever. 
people can get going on a smaller amount of money than ever. I mean, that eight year, the eight year old you can learn about an FPGA. Yeah, actually, that is really, uh, really neat, really cool. I mean, the resources that are available are incredible and like the growth in them is incredible. I mean, and I say the tools are interesting because they have improved and got more accessible. They also, it's also a world where like change comes over time, you know, like electronic design tools. I think it's so adjacent to like software and programming tools, which just like kind of grow explosively. But then like, I think because maybe programmers are really used to like, you know, renewing your own tools, because if you don't like how something works, you may Make your own version of it that like works the way you want it to and maybe like I have a theory like electrical engineers are so adjacent that like there's a belief that like this world should be able to also make its own tools but when it comes to software like I don't know I feel like a lot of electrical engineering design tools are honestly a bit neglected oh they are oh they definitely are I mean it's it's where it's the last bastion of tickle i mean i mean uh, tickle's oh, great you're, i mean you're, that was a good yeah, yeah, deep yeah, reference i had yeah. to look blankly at you before yeah, no. it all returned to my mind <laughs> you're right exactly i, I here i'm TK, gonna, uh, uh, yeah exactly t, t kinter right there you go yeah now nah, nah. yikes <laughs> i you know but i remember teaching a workshop on how to like learn to use an electronic design tool in like yeah, 2007 and like the ui hasn't changed for that tool to this day like i could just give the same spiel and it would but I think change is coming. I think that this is the EDA has historically been the last bastion of proprietary software, and that's changing. And we're seeing now, I mean, certainly we are building stuff on open EDA tools. There's been a lot of growth there, and that's really good. You're right. And I think it's it, the great thing about open source is when once something is open, a domain is open, it never goes back. Open source software is not deleted. Yeah. Generally. And it can be closed, but not, it, not deleted. Well, no, it can't even be closed. You can take a fork. Is what you can do. You can't yeah. actually close it. And then you, you can change the license, but that that which existed is still there. It's still there. And it and it, it will exist forever. I feel like you're talking about rivers. <laughs> I, well, no, there's not, I, I feel that like we get and I think you you know you were hitting on an important point in terms of like how much change is actually possible. So I think that we lose track of things can be so frustrating in the moment. And you're just looking at your experience with autonomous aircraft where the time had to be right, you know, and and, you know, you have to be patient because the world will change. Once it changes, it can change more than you ever thought possible. I mean, this is why I think it's just so great to read the, the history of technology. You know, I remember reading about the history of development of a helicopter. And, you know, I think it was like in the 1890s, someone wrote a newspaper editorial, which is like, the flood of credulous capitalists who believe in some sort of chemical based engine never ceases petroleum engines, chemical engines. These people will never oh amount God. to anything. And it's That's like, great. this was on the verge yeah. of the invention of like the gas engine. And right. like, uh, yeah, it, I think it did actually change the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it, right. it came to be, um, but like in the moment, it totally didn't look like anything was moving. Yeah. Right. Well, that and that's. I mean, it's such a. It's such a great. I think it's important as technologists that we retain that fundamental because that is a fundamental optimism that that better things are possible. Are you running for president anytime soon? I'm good. I, 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 <laughs> Do you? Are you looking for the thing that will crush me? <laughs> no, <laughs> my <laughs> optimism. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, how yeah, yeah, there's right. a lot of optimizing to be done there, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Now no. I feel bad. Right, now I, feel bad. I take it all back. I take it all back. Yeah, but just I, I just want to do like the small things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep doing the small things. What I, I saw one of the one optimizer. of the projects that you worked on was a like single use drone to deliver right. remote parts that would then be biodegradable. Yeah, that was um, at my, the work I was doing before the current company was, we had a few different autonomous aircraft we shipped and that was for a specific DARPA program where the idea was to have a one-time use, yes, biodegradable aircraft for like one-off cargo delivery. That's dope. Had to be that a lot of dope. harder it's constraints. Like, it's like, exactly. shit disappears. Right. Sorry, I, I mean, I know it's not foosh because it like- No, it I mean, it was described like, as like folded but cardboard. But it's like cool. <laughs> we used cardboard as a prototyping material. The ultimate material that we explored developing, working with, actually with a research lab on it, uh, was a, a lignin, which is kind of like a papery, fabric-y kind of material that was uh, had biological seams. And so you'd activate the- um, fungal spores that would then start to consume the paper fabric material. That's and dope. the the awesome thing is when the two different colonies of fungus meet, 
they basically go to war. Oh, uh, oh wow. So there's this uh, process called hypertrophy where they're like, you can't have this like calorie. We're going to digest it faster. And so then the, you know, um, paper lignin would just like extremely go Literally to tatters. Eats itself. Oh, yeah. that's right. Um, but like, there's like a slow growth period and then the, the colonies meet and then it like ex- it goes very quickly nice. after that. Oh, that's cool. I mean, this that's is hard cool. enough as it is that to is actually have uh, a, a vehicle that will take a payload somewhere and then doing it with all different materials that have to disappear in a certain time frame. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I'd say like DARPA work. The idea is you, you know, kind of do some research. It's not where I like to live, which is like it's a little higher up in the, you know, uh, speculative. Like I like right. to actually ship things. But we did achieve the mission as described in terms of like exploring what was possible and producing a report about like something that uh, they they have a grading scale for like how real technology is. Technology readiness levels, TRL levels, great Wikipedia page. And mm. uh, the idea was to get it to TRL three, which was what we what we accomplished at the same time on the same team we were working on uh simultaneously working on a tethered autonomous helicopter and so we were we were making autonomous aircraft left and right oh my god dang that's That's dope so much fun projects go on and on thanks for the opportunity to talk about them oh yeah yeah, yeah. this this has been great it's been so much fun having you and love your your disposition is so inspiring i think i'll talk i'll take my optimism elsewhere yeah (laughs) no it's great it's great and I think that, that just to the optimism and yet the responsibility about how you engineer and engineer in a way that is rigorous and yet forward looking, it's just very inspiring. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. You've been listening to On the Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. For show notes, to learn more about our guests or to sign up for our mailing list, visit us at onthemetal.fm. On the Metal is a production of Oxide Computer Company and is recorded in the Oxide Garage in Oakland, California. To learn more about Oxide, visit us at oxide.computer. On the Metal is hosted by me, Brian Cantrell, along with Jess Frisell, and we are frequently joined by our boss, Steve Tuck. Our original and awesome theme music is by J.J. Weisler at Pollen Music Group. You can learn more about J.J. and Pollen at pollenmusicgroup.com. We are edited and produced by Chris Hill and his crew at HumblePod. From Jess, from Steve, from me, and from all of us at Oxide Computer Company, thanks for listening to On the Metal. 